Next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, uh, John raised an interesting point, which I think will be a recurrent theme, and, and actually, uh, you know, is a recurrent uh, discussion area within Emerge. So that's why I didn't contribute to the discussion uh, before, because I have my ten minutes in the sun now. So, the as I thought about what I wanted to say. Um, it is a balance between this idea of discovery, and, and discovery can be, you know, across the EMR. It can also be in, in, in other kinds of cohorts. We're not going to consider that here. And then, um, and then uh, implementation in the EMR, and its implementation is, as everybody in on this call knows, or everybody on this call who's part of Emerge knows, is not simply a matter of dumping a bunch of genotypes into the EMR and letting magic happen. It's a very complex process that we are just beginning to understand. So, next slide. Randy. Good. Next. Click again. Click. Okay. So, um, I just wanted to make the point which Rex has made before, that uh, discovery science in Emerge has, is involved not just discovering new genotype phenotype associations, but discovering how to do research across the electronic medical records. So, Deploying algorithms uh, that work across multiple EMRs. This is a, a screenshot of a table from the uh, from the hypothyroidism paper. Click again, Randy. And then, of course, uh, using uh, uh, existing data. That's the hypothyroidism GWAS. Next. And then we've shown that you can use the EMRs for phenomwide association, uh, which, uh, as Rex said, and I will reemphasize. Is, a, is, an, is, is an experiment that um, is hard to think about uh, implementing in other kinds of data sets. The, de the, the principle being that uh, the phenotypes have to be broadly defined and of medical relevance. And so if you have a diabetes study, you can, uh, it's very difficult to think of how to do this. In community courts, it's conceivable this could be done in some fashion, but it just depends on what the phenotype definition is. And, and we have interesting phenotypes in, uh, in Emerge. Next. So this is my version of a slide that Rex showed. I, I updated it after uh, Irwin uh, said that he thought the numbers were a little bit wrong, and I'm sure that everybody will tell me that their numbers are higher than they were. But the, this is this is the current number that I see is 362,000, and the imputed data set for GWAS is 50,000, and may, as I as we heard just now, go as high as uh, a couple of tens of thousands more, so so 70,000, 80,000, 90,000. So click again. So no, we'll go back. Thank you. Um, I uh, this is a personal comment. I think that if we're going to individualize medicine, if we're going to treat patients differently, the only rational way to develop a data set to do that is some approach like this. If you have a thousand patients and ten of them are likely to respond differently in some way, uh, those ten will never provide the evidence base that will allow you to treat them differently with a straight face. They won't pass a sniff test. So you, if you have 100,000 people and 1,000 of them respond differently, then you can start to make a case that this group should be defined differently. So it speaks to, uh, it speaks to what Gail was talking about with the rare variants. We, we're, we're, we have to have evidence around rare variants. And when she says rare variants, she might be one in 10,000. When I say rare variants, I might be one in 1,000. But those are the kinds of uh, subsets that we can now begin to identify with a data set that is this large. And again, I emphasize, and, and I think that uh, the point has been made before, that uh, there's a lot of GWAS data in this set. Uh, there's, there's less uh, rare variant sequence data, rare variant or sequence data in this set. Go on. Next slide. So, that, so as I thought about what to, to say about uh, the discovery and implementation missions, and I guess I telegraph my bias at the top because I, I, I think we ought to think about both and, and in some way of, of balancing those. And I'll come back to the idea that they interact with each other at the end of this little chat. Um, so I, I thought, well, what, is Emerge, what can Emerge contribute uniquely to discovery and what can Emerge contribute uniquely to implementation? There are lots of people doing GWASs, for example, in lipid traits or in acute myocardial infarction traits. And we can participate in those studies because we have large data sets that can contribute to very large uh, meta-analyses and that sort of thing. But what Emerge ought to focus on, I think, is what we can do that other people would have a harder time to do. 
And that's what I'm going to talk about. Next slide. So um, the easiest examples, I think, are in drug responses and cancer susceptibility. And uh, you can say, well, you know, uh, we understand the pharmacogenomics of uh, clopidogrel or warfarin or simvastatin, and therefore we don't need to study them anymore. All we need to do is implement them. And the same thing goes for some of the commoner cancer susceptibility alleles. We know that, you know, uh, I'll just say that. So the, but the real question is, do we really know all there is to know about variable responses? That's a rhetorical question. I'm going to make the case over the next three or four slides with an old drug that there's lots and lots and lots that we don't know, and part of the reason we don't know it is because we have been limited in the size of data sets that we've been able to study so far. Next. So I'm going to talk, a bit, I'm going to go show you four or five slides of warfarin data. This is a slide that I'm very fond of showing because it shows uh, what happens when you examine people who are on warfarin, on very large doses of warfarin, to uh, achieve therapeutic uh, anticoagulation. And without going into the details, the major message of this slide is actually that the reason, mo the reason people need very large doses to achieve therapeutic anticoagulation is because they're non-compliant. They don't actually take their warfarin or they don't absorb it for some reason. But if you take people who actually take their warfarin and who have uh, very high dosage requirements, it turns out that there's a group of people who have rare variants in BCORC1. So this is the gene that encodes the warfarin target. Hit the advance button, Brandy. Uh, and uh, there's a rare variant called D36Y. D36Y is rare, but if you practice, uh, if, you, if you run an anticoagulation clinic in Israel, you have to take it into account because it's a 5%er in the Ashkenazi population, and those people require very large doses of warfarin. And I'm sure, I'm sure that there are other rarer variants that have very large effect sizes when it comes to determining warfarin dose. Now, if we, if we ever use warfarin again. Next slide. So this is, these are data from a study that we did uh, in BioView uh, probably around the time we were joining Emerge. So these are older data, but I think they really make an interesting point. We looked at the predictors of warfarin steady state dose in our own cohort. And uh, you can see that they're, they're the 2C9, star 2 and star 3. Those are the, uh, the marquee variants in 2C9. They have strong associations, they have minor low frequencies that are shown, strong associations with uh, ultimate steady state dose. There are three VCORC1 SNPs, all in LD in, uh, in this particular group, with very, very strong associations with warfarin dose. Go on. It, okay. Now that population is actually both a Caucasian and African American population. When we broke it down by European American or African American, the statistical significance is obviously much less than the African Americans because the data set is much smaller, but we actually lose the CYP2C9 star 2 signal entirely, and the genomic architecture of VCORC1 is such that the three SNPs that were in LD for the Caucasians are no longer in LD in the African Americans, and, and the SNP that counts is actually the bottom one, 99, 232, 31. So hit the, hit the button again, Brandy. Uh, so this, this is a warfarin. Warfarin is more complicated. There's more than two genes. And I'll just show you where the other genes are on this slide. Hit the button again. So we actually looked at common variants across many, many genes in this slide. And the point is, to look down at the bottom, there are SIP variants in African Americans that are, that, whose minor low frequencies are, uh, for example, uh, star 8 is a 7 percenter in African Americans with, a, with an effect on ultimate dose but nobody ever thinks about that one when they consider creating algorithms. So I think we really uh, have a long way to go before we understand even common variation in commonly used drugs. Uh, 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 that's what these slides are supposed to show. Next slide. So you heard from Rex that there are efforts to implement uh, some really interesting uh, genetic uh, variants in the EMR, Factor V Leiden, HIV, HIV and, and ApoL1, and these are the poster children for the idea that there are common variants that may have large effect sizes in defined populations. And my question to you and the rest of and anyone else on the call is, are, are these really the only common variants that uh, have large effect sizes, or isn't there a place for discovery of more of these? The ApoL1 story has really only emerged in the last two or three years, Erwin can talk much more about that than I can, but it's a 
it's a fascinating story, and of course, it's only in African Americans. So, uh, yes. Dan, this is Terry. You, yes. you have about one minute. You have about one minute, please. And I have one. Uh, I have about one minute. You're right. Next. Yeah. Okay. And then, as you heard from Iftikhar, go back. Have you heard from Iftikhar? Uh, uh, we are also deploying complex combinations, and the questions are how to deploy them, how to validate them, how to measure impact and outcome. And uh, I'll just ask for it to hit the next slide. So, discovery science: the 362,000 DNA samples coupled to the EMR can enable our FIWAS. I've already said that. Complex outcomes. Brandy, hit the slide. And the complex outcomes are not only longitudinal over time and drug responses and disease subtypes, but gene by all those. Next, uh, I think we have to think about ancestry and, and develop ways of, uh, of, of generating larger African American cohorts. We probably have 50,000 African Americans across Emerge right now. And then uh, there are issues around privacy that we still need to address. Next. Uh, the implementation science, I, I'll let you read what it says there, but it basically, uh, how do, if you're going to implement, you have to have evidence, and the evidence comes from the discovery side. How do you do it? In who? Education issues, decision support issues, and then tracking outcomes, I think, is something that somebody has to do, and if it's not us, who else? Next slide. And then I just want to make this point that um, as we implement, we learn, and as we learn, uh, we generate larger data sets. So if you implement HFE in a very large cohort, you'll generate data on HFE that will then feed back into the discovery side. So I don't think that it's discovery or implementation. They each feed on each other. And, uh, and I would argue that we have to retain both. But we have to think about what kind of discovery we can do that we're uniquely positioned to do. That's the end of my 10 minutes. Thank you for that. And we're going to try and quickly pass the baton to uh, Mary Relling for her uh, reaction. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can.